Um, I, I thought your talk was excellent, and I thought oh, the you. Um, uh, the work that you presented was very exciting because it's got lots of applications in the future. Right. Perhaps we can start by if you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your, where you work. Sure. I am a senior research scientist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I did my PhD dissertation research with Claude Mears at UC Davis and went on to do two postdocs, the first at NIH with Gary Griffiths in the Imaging Probe Development Center and the second with uh, Dr. Reese Sachs and Larson at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the Mole Molecular Imaging and Training for Oncology R25T program. Right. Okay, so um, you talked about, um, you gave a presentation on uh, a novel way of doing uh, therapy using radioisotopes, and we've, we've talked about that a lot in the podcast before, but there were some interesting aspects to what you did. Uh, what you did was in, the, in, a, in a mouse model, right? Yes. So, but um, you actually had a special kind of antibody that targeted um, colon cancer. Um, what was special about it? So it's a bispecific antibody that has the IgG framework, but then coming off of the C-terminus light chain, there are single chain domains that are that consist of a sequence for a anti-DOTA haptin antibody. So you're able to first administer the bispecific antibody in a non-radioactive form and wait sufficient time for the antibody to accrue at the tumor as well as administer a clearing agent to reduce binding at off target sites. And then we subsequently administer a low molecular weight radioactive DOTA haptin that has extremely rapid renal clearance. And when you combine the radioimmunotherapy with that bispecific antibody, you achieve extremely high therapeutic index because the residence of the radioactivity is is diminished by the pharmacokinetics of the small molecule. Right. So basically, you've got a very high target to background ratio. That's right. And that's important because a lot of the therapies that we've looked at with radioisotopes in the past, they've been some have been good, some have been okay, but but very few. Um, actually have enough target to background ratio to produce a cure. I mean, they, they basically suppress it for a while, maybe do a do number of cycles. That's what we've seen with, for example, the neuroendocrine therapies. But it's only with things that have a very high target to background, like old-fashioned radioiodine therapy for thyroid cancer, that we've been able to get a cure. So the potential is that by increasing that target to background, by doing that sort of targeting, um, uh, then clearance, so that you get rid of the background, and then giving a tracer that gets cleared very rapidly for, from the from the from the body apart from the tumour. So you you can really go and give a very high dose of radiation that you might actually result in in a clearance uh, in in of the tumour by um, by having a high target to background. What was the back target to backgrounds for the different tissue types? Well, for the I've actually developed a system in three different models, and in the GD2 system, it was superior to the GPA33 system, which I just described in my presentation for targeting colorectal cancer. And in the GD2 system, which is for neuroblastoma, sarcoma, other tumors, it was approximately 140 to 1 for the blood. Wow and 20 to 1 for the kidney. And we also developed a curative regimen in a IMR32 xenograft model in nude mice and showed, and, and showed complete responses, including cures. So we've applied this to other targets. Uh, in the HER2 system, right, for breast cancer. we actually get, have the lowest therapeutic index. Uh, and that is because the therapeutic index for that system is approximately 20 to 30 to 1 for the blood. But right. we still have 10 to 1 for the kidney, which we're happy about. But the, the reason why is because in a pre-targeting system, you ideally want an antigen antibody complex that does not internalize. And with HER2 targeting with Herceptin, with trastuzumab, you actually get internalization as part of the pharmacodynamic modulation. And that complex internalizes and that serves as an artificial receptor for a subsequently administered radionuclide haptin. So our therapeutic index is diminished by 
with diminishing tumor uptake in that system. Right. So we still have exciting blood levels that are very low. We have kidney levels that are very low, but the therapeutic index in that case is attenuated because the tumor uptake is not as substantial. Right, but in that case, of course, you're dealing with a uh, with a with a type of cancer that's very difficult to treat. Definitely, definitely, right. yeah. And we want to apply it to ovarian, pancreatic. We the the targets yeah, wonderful pancreatic cancer. I mean, that's a yeah, really tough one. The targets <laughs> were specifically chosen to, to encompass a wide variety of human solid tumors, and our proof of concept studies. We've only been able to comprehensively evaluate three different targets but we have more antibodies in the pipeline against other targets and we also want to look at HER2 targeting in other models as well besides just breast cancer so the most of my work in that study has been with the BT474 uh, breast cancer xenograft model and but we've started to extend it to SCOV3 which is ovarian cancer line and there's actually another talk at at this meeting that describes kinetic modeling and dissymmetry of that pre-targeting strategy. Right, so um, you gave, in the example you gave, you gave three cycles of treatment, yes. right? Yes, yes. Now, that's not many uh, considering, but what you really want to do is, is, is give enough therapy so that you don't develop resistance, right? That's right. We want, I, we've administered as much as five cycles so far and still haven't seen toxicity. And what we're really interested in is the radiobiologic factors that determine response, whether they be intrinsic or extrinsic. And also, how do we account for low antigen density? How do we modify our pre-targeting strategy in order to obtain the highest therapeutic index with the least trial and error? You know, right. how can we make it patient-specific and... That's really why we wanted a theranostic component right. where we could have a non-invasive quantitative approach to dosimetry that we can adjust accordingly with kinetic modeling potentially in order to devise a patient-specific treatment plan. Right. And, and of course, you're dealing with the most difficult concepts we've had uh, with dealing with cancer, and a lot of that's been... A lot of the cancer treatments involve surgery or radiotherapy where you've got large tumours that you can actually see, but a lot of the cancers that we really have problems with are the small tumours. This is not going to have a problem with the small tumour, right? Right, and also be, because it's systemic, yeah. which m the radioimmunotherapy that, um, that we see having the highest therapeutic index is, is compartmental, <laughs> where it's intrathecal administration for treatment of pediatric neuroblastoma cancers, yes. and we want to develop develop a systemic therapy in order to address residual micrometastatic disease right. and similar to what um, peptide uh, targeted therapies um, are designed for. So we, we want to develop our model with solid tumors because we acknowledge that solid tumor radioimmunotherapy is very inefficient and largely mm. limited by the myelotoxicity as one of the gentlemen spoke about during the session. But so we want to overcome that. We want to establish dose response relationships during our uh, pilot preclinical development. But we are looking to address um, small metastatic tumors or a, um, a disseminated model in order to verify that we can apply it in that context. But we're confident that if we can apply it in a solid tumor complex, especially one that is ex rapidly growing, that we can address small volume disease because the antibody uptake we expect is to be greater because you don't have the same tumor microenvironment complications such as stroma, diffusion limitations, etc. So typically the antibody uptake is 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 higher in the small volume disease. Yeah. And so we, we really consider the solid tumor case to be a, um, a nice model for development. Right. And of course the, the, um, uh, the, the trick to this is developing the, the antibody, really? Yes. And, and you're genetically engineering the antibody? Yes, we are. So it's a platform approach in that the clearing agent and the radio-labeled dotahaptin are, are the same and you just interchange the antibody. And what I feel is, is a major advancement in this 
about space is that the IgG single chain format that we use, we have proven that you can genetically engineer antibodies against multiple targets reproducibly without substantial issues with expression yields and aggregation. So that, I, from what I've seen with the bispecific antibody um, production previously, that you have to have the proper structure in order to um, get high yields and in order to enable these preliminary studies in vivo because the, with the pre-targeting pre -targeting technique by design you want to saturate the tumor so you have to do extensive dose escalation and, and that requires substantial amounts of antibody. Right, right. And the um, uh, the haptin that you talked about, what, what haptin did you use? It's benzyl dota. So it's benzyl dota that we radio label. We obtain it. It's from a commercial source, and then we radio label with uh, either lutetium or yttrium isotopes. Right. Right. Okay. So um, um, so there's enough uh, path length in those to actually actually kill the tumor in terms of that? Yes, yes. We anticipate that for larger disease that you would want a beta emitter with the longer half length, but we're also working to adapt the system for alpha emitters for right. the residual disease and hopefully combine the two together because wow. of the versatility of the, of the technique. And we're looking at multiple dosing strategies where maybe we can give the antibody and the clearing agent once and then follow it with multiple radioactive injections where we alternate, let's say, between a beta and alpha. Ah, okay. We, we you know, we're really that's going to be governed by microdosimetry and the initial targets, targeting that we see with, with the system. This is really exciting. <laughs> I mean, this is amazing. I mean, this is really going to deal with a lot of the cancers that we have been so resistant to, to therapy for such a long time. I think what's really inspiring is the initial work that has been done by all the pioneers of pre-targeting, especially with the streptavidin constructs, yep. as well as the anti-haptin antibodies uh, specifically the Sharkey Goldenberg constructs, and those have achieved e exploration in clinical trials, and I, I think it's it's really impressive, their data, but for example, with the with the streptavidin construct, you can only give it once. Right. So there's, we, we are um, really driven by the milestones that have already been achieved, and that's why we have such an emphasis on therapeutic index. Um, we, we, we acknowledge that really the only way that we're going to be able to achieve substantial responses in these tumors is to be able to administer very high amounts of radioactivity, and, and so we're we're specifically designing that um, to enable translation of the approach with the high therapeutic index. So when are we going to see this in humans? <laughs> we hope within three to five years we're attempting to attain funding for the GMP production of the anti GP833 antibody and then we're also looking at other targets but that's going to be the biggest milestone is 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 producing that at uh, GMP quality and, and going through everything that's required by the FDA and then as well as deciding whether we need to manufacture the clearing agent or if we're going to attempt the radioimmunotherapy without and then the GMP manufacture of the the haptin will be a concern as well as well as the safety toxicity yeah. etc so we have some previous pre-targeting construct that we can build from for but we we the biggest limitation that we see is is the production of the bispecific antibody right enough volume so it's a bit you need a very different volume for a mouse than a human obviously. definitely yes we anticipate that we'll have to inject hundreds of milligrams right right well very exciting stuff. Oh, thank you. Really exciting stuff. Oh, and, thank uh, you so much. And I uh, thank you so much for giving up your time for the podcast. It's oh, yeah. Time. Oh, of course. And where can people find out more about this? So we are on the Sloan Kettering website. You can look at my name or you can look up my research director's name, Dr. Stephen Larson, and find out more and obtain our contact information. Excellent. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Okay.